Um, this morning I'm born again, and I'm delighted to be in Shiloh Worship Center. This is a unique place. <laughs> uh, I didn't know, is it because of it's a cornerstone Sunday, or you're always like this? You, you, I, <laughs> I need to sit now with Pastor Alice and, <laughs> and see if these are always like this. This is the place to be. Bwana Yesu <laughs> Asifiwe. It's a, it's a long time since I even saw the gentlemen dance aloud. My seniors were here this morning. Bwana Yesu Asifiwe. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think this is outside the normal when there are occasions, like when we have the, 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 the um, what do you call it, the in-gatherings, yes. We have all been here one more time with my family, and equally we were delighted because of what we saw. So I think you guys are doing the right thing, and the Spirit of the Lord dwells in this place, and we can feel it even as we walk in. It's good also to see my friends for a long time. Some of these people, we have been friends for many years, but we don't see each other now frequently because we are on the other side. I worship in the express service on the other side, uh, in the main cathedral. Please, once in a while, also come and visit us. Yes, and this morning I said, I'm born again. And I said, I haven't said, that I'm married and I have three girls. They are represented by one. Precious, please wave to the crowd. You can start people to see you. This is Precious. This is my second born. Please have a seat. Yesterday, I, I was also told to come and greet you by my first born, June. We spent the evening up to late into the night with the high and Precious. And I want to still say that I'm still married, although my wife is not here. Uh, Sangura and Rebecca would have said, if, she is, if, are, if I still am not. Um, she is seeing, they have accompanied other ladies married in our home to go and see my dad. So they are having a good time with my dad. And they say they will report all our sins <laughs> done and yet to be done. So <laughs> my dad called me yesterday night to tell me he will deal with us. So <laughs> but we are grateful and she sent her greetings. Even this morning we have talked and she told me Nikifika Shairo. I know Morim has recognized the alumni. But because I was seated this way, I would still want the alumni to start. One more time. If you have been to Cornerstone Academy, please start. The children, yes. The children first. If you have ever been to Cornerstone Academy, started by Precious. <laughs> yes, I can see joy. Any others? Yes, I can see the others. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good. Let's give a, a good clap to these good ones. Thank you. And I can tell you, they are excellent ambassadors of Cornerstone. Please, you can have your seats. Excellent ambassadors of Cornerstone. I think I know what has been happening in a good number of these ones' lives, and they are doing a great job. If you want your child to be transformed, a child of character, a child will be a change agent of their time. This is a school to be in. How about our parents? If you have ever been a parent in Cornerstone Academy, please st stand. I'm also studying. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Great. Let's clap for these ones. Amen. And you can see they are looking beautiful. That is what it means to interact with Cornerstone Academy. You not only, you not only change your child, but even you yourself. Thank you so much, parents. May the Lord bless you. And I know there are also many of you here who are seated. Tomorrow you'll be our parent, isn't it? Yes. So may the Lord bless you, even as you make that decision that we want to take our children, not only where we care about their academic well-being, but also their character formation, their spiritual formation, and the people who will be the leaders wherever they shall be. Because we train our children to be influencers. We know the biggest challenge that we are facing this time is the influence from the society. Whether it is the media or whether it is any of the environment that our children are getting into. 
many times I have made reference to ourselves. I saw TV for the first time when I went to Form 1. And I know I'm not alone. <laughs> you, you, you know when Rebecca is laughing at me? <laughs> I know I'm not alone, yes? yes? How many wore their first shoe as they were going to Form 1? Are there any? Yes, yes and my heart is up there. You know, that in between, before then, I used to wear my daddy's shoe when he's not around. You know, because my dad would come over the weekend. But in between, I wanted my feet to shine, to look clean, like those ones of the teacher's children. Right? But we have a God who changes situations. There's a God you can never remain in the same place once you know who you know, that the one you know can change things, can change situations. That is the God I'm here to proclaim this morning. He's the God that I'm, I'm going to talk about this morning. So I'm delighted. I didn't say that I'm the chairman of Cornerstone Academy. Chairman needs a hard clap, you know? <laughs> and I always keep on saying, I'm only riding on the shoulders of the great men who came before me. We know that they did an amazing job. I'm just riding on that, and we are grateful that we are the ones at this point we are leading. Thank you, um, um, our head teacher. The teachers of Cornerstone, where are you? Please start. I forgot one important team. Please let's clap for this team. They are doing an amazing job. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I have always kept on wondering, a person who receives a child who do not know maybe how to take care of their toiletry, who doesn't know how to take care of their noses, and they are able to train them, and they had them, had them offer to the next, that they are trained on how to read and write, and from there, all we are waiting for is the good grades. Isn't that wonderful? It is the work of these people representing the larger team that we have in Cornerstone Academy. Buona yesu wa Today, I want us to take us through stewarding children for success. Stewarding children for success. There are two important terms that I've mentioned there. One of them is being a steward and secondary is success. I'm sure everyone would want your children to be successful. Is that the case? Yes. But the problem is that any time we mention success, we think in terms of the material things and we think about the temporal things that really also go when we go from this world. But here I'm here to tell you that success, there will be one day when we shall go before our God. And one thing that I know I'll be asked is what have I done with the children that God gave me? Because I was there and I prayed for a spouse and I prayed for a child and the child was presented to me one day. The other weekend I was telling people how it was when my first don, my firstborn daughter was born. I was in hospital. My wife had refused to sleep because she said she was sure she was going to die if she slept. So she stayed awake until I came. And when I held the child, she slept. That tells you what mothers go through. But then after that, the doctors, of course, we were there, we talked and so on. And I'm the way walking out. And a nurse is busy shouting, Baba June, Baba June, me, I'm not even turning. I don't know who is Baba June. <laughs> until the nurse tapped me and told me, it is you I'm talking about. Now, all of a sudden, I changed from just being Peter to being now Baba June. And the, the whole burden came on to me because I had seen what my dad had gone through. My dad was the present father in my life, very present. Every school function, it is my dad who came. Every time, I still remember him running one morning when our last born was being born and there were complications on the road. And we saw ladies surrounding my mother. And my dad passed us, because the children, you know, we were running, we didn't even look at what was happening. My dad passed us running very fast. He went to the school, got the headmaster. The headmaster was the only person who had a car in the village. And got the headmaster, who drove very quickly. They picked my mom, and the rest is history, because my brother now is an aspiring preacher. That is what... You, I, that came to my mind. My, my brother who follows me, one time he had a complication, a tooth complication. 
And when it was removed, the guy couldn't stop breathe, uh, breathing. I didn't know there was such a case. And he was losing blood very quickly. And unfortunately, he was all negative. So locating people who are all negative was a great challenge. And I hear they had to go and look for my dad who was working far from home. And he traveled overnight. He says there was no means of transport from that place. You know some deeper part of Nyandarwa where our show comes from? <laughs> Pastor Beatrice knows some of those areas. And he walked for many kilometers until a road passed him and he ran to get hold of it and was able to ride on it until he was brought to our Karao JM hospital where my brother was admitted. And he was the guy who could donate at that point. And the doctors removed as much blood as could keep him still going. Because all negative was not easily available, even to this day. There are associations of people with the negative uh, blood type. But he was there. There are the many times that I saw him move to Kisi, where my sister was, was, was practicing as a nurse. So those are the things that were running in my mind the many times he would come and put his pay slip on, on the table and share with us and tell us, the five of you in high school, we were many in my house, the five of you in high school, and two in college, look at what I'm left with my pay slip. I've taken a loan, I'm giving each of you this, this, and this. And when we go back, you don't feel bad when you got only one piece of kipande. You know how they are cut? And you know for the next one term, you have to survive with it. That was a man who was determined. Of course, I'm not forgetting that it is my mom who had to make sure that all these children are cooked for and they're provided for. And sometimes when my dad forgets to buy clothes because there were no, no money extra to buy clothes, it is mom who had to look on the side and see what he had to do. And those are the things that were occurring, that were passing through my mind. And as a young father, for the first time somebody has called me Baba June, I knew it is me who is taking over from where my dad left. It is my time now to be the father. And I knew I cannot let my dad down. It was time for me to pay back. And my daughter is here, <laughs> and I do, I do it. I try to do it. Being a steward is not a simple responsibility. When God presents those children before you, I know sometimes we look at stewardship from the perspective of resources, money, careers, other things that are presented to us. But God one day chose you to be the right parent, to be the parent who can be able to take care of this child and to help them to move from that toddler who can be able to do nothing to that person who will be the president of this country. Say hallelujah. Amen. That child who can be the governor of Nairobi who will come and change things because you put the right values on your child. These are the parents that we are called to be. So when we talk about success, what are we talking about? Genesis 39.2 says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. Joshua 1.7, God told young Joshua, who was taking up from the very experienced mighty man called Moses, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. So God is already saying, what is the one thing that Joshua needs to do so that he can be successful? When we talked about Joseph, we know it is because the Lord was with, was with him that he became successful. First Samuel 18 to 14, and David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. Because the Lord was with him, David became very successful. And when we talk about success, we are not just talking about that child who scored 400 and something. We are not just talking about the A student, because we have seen many A students who, after they have finished their degree in medicine, uh, I think it is my brother who was telling me, or Dero who was telling me, of a young man in their village, actual relative, who the parents insisted because you scored an A, you must do law. And the boy did law. And he finished. Now he walks around the village. One had the constitution and the other had the Bible. And he just moves around telling people, ask me any question to do the constitution and the Bible. He has lost it. That is not what we are looking for. 
We are looking for people who will be, who come and become the change agents that we need. We are seeing these children that they are as material, but they are out there, and we know all the things that are happening. Just listened, we had the case that was determined, I think, early this week, the one of one Mr. Irongo. Cambridge Dictionary defines success as the achieving of the results wanted or hoped for. You know, those results that you wanted or hoped for. Whereas the Bakray Wellbeing Institute defines success as the peace of mind that is the direct result of self-satisfaction in knowing you did your best to become the best that you are capable of becoming. I have said time and again that there is nothing else except human beings. That only everything else strives to become the best it can ever be. Have you ever seen a tree that was capable of being 10 feet high or even 90 meters high that refused to grow? Or a lion that decided me I cannot eat antelopes. I'll be eating grass. You know? Everything else strives to be the best it can be. But what are we seeing? That it is possible for us just to sit on the sofa and watch TV or social media the whole day and refuse to think. Or we refuse to do what we are supposed to do. And we as the parents, maybe sometimes the best that we do is to complain. Instead of really thinking, what is the mandate that God gave me? The Hebrew word for success means to be cautious, to be intelligent, to be skillful, to be wise and to be sensible. That is what success means in the Hebrew language. To be cautious, intelligent, skillful, wise, and sensible. And therefore we can ask ourselves, when we think about the success of our children, what do we see? When we look at what God has placed in our hands, what do we see? When we look into their future, what do we see? To steward our children for success, we need a biblical vision of the finished product. <coughs> that you can be able to look at the product that God has given you, that child, and you can see 25 years down the line, where would I want this child to be? And therefore, where should we go for instruction on how to help this product to be the best it's supposed to be? It's only in the word of God. And that is why, as parents, one of the key responsibilities that we can do is to make sure that we bring up our children knowing who God is in the house of the Lord. That in the morning when we were coming with Precious, I was seeing there were some children praying aloud in the, in the estate. And I asked, when was the last, where are these children in church? And maybe that question I should ask when I have the next meeting in the estate. Because these are not different from my own children. And I cannot point fingers and say, these parents don't know how to take care of. What about if one day that young man comes and they want the heart of my daughter? <laughs> what will happen? And themselves, they were never told, it is good to always go before the Lord. All they know is, you can get physical. You can use your intelligence. You can use all these other things. But they don't know that the best place that a man can go to is only to his father who is our God. And therefore, it is upon us to make sure that we see what is it that we can do to help our children. Now, that is success. How about stewardship? We say stewardship is defined as the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. That means that those things sometimes, not sometimes, whatever has been entrusted to your care, does it belong to you? No, it doesn't belong to you. Somebody else owns that product. Actually, God gave you that product. And in this case, the product is that child. And therefore, if the child was presented before you, and for us, we have been given the responsibility to be good stewards, what is it that you are going to do with that child? I would like us to read the book of Matthew 25, 14 to 30. 
Matthew 25, 14 to 13. Matthew 25, 14 to 13. Um, so for those that are able to see, can everybody see the screen? Yes. Great. So we start. When we read the word of God, we start. Isn't it? Yes. yes. Let's do like the way they did when the children of Israel came from captivity uh, after the 70 years. Matthew 25, 14 to 30, it is the parable of the tyrant. Let's go. For it will... Let's read first that once more. And cast the worthless servant. May the Lord bless his name. Please have a seat. The parable of the steward. Uh, sorry. The parable of the talents. We had this parable since we were young. As we went to study school, we have heard about it. The one thing that we can tell, because the parable represents the kingdom of God, and the parable represents God as that person who left the talents to his, um, to, uh, to his team. <clears throat> one thing that we can tell is that God owns everything, and myself... I own nothing. That reality needs to sink in our lives. That God owns everything and I own nothing. You know, David said in Psalms 24:1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness 
their love. And in Psalms 89, 11, he said, The heavens are yours, and the earth also is yours. The world and all its fullness. Everything that we have belongs to God. And therefore, we can, whether it is our careers, whether it is our finances, whether it is our relations, whether it is the land that we possess, everything that we own belongs to who? And for us, we are presented here to be good stewards of that which God has presented to us. And one of that is the children that God presents into our? The moment we realize that God has given us a responsibility, then we can be careful, cautious parents. We can be parents who would want that one day when the owner comes, because we have had, after the owner has gone, the owner will still come back. And when he comes back, he'll say, what have you done with what I presented before you? That time, when the time for answering comes, then we shall be able to say, God, look at what I've been able to do. This is one of the items or the products that you presented before me, and I have been a faithful steward. The next thing that we need to remember, God entrusts us with everything that we have. He has entrusted me. I am just have been entrusted to. It belongs to him. As a trustee, I don't own it. As a trustee, I don't... Mine is not to destroy. Have you ever heard of parents who have killed their children because of 20 shillings? Have you heard of parents who are selling their own children so they can get money? I have been working in an environment where you have heard of parents sometimes who exchange their daughters so that they can be giving, getting the day-to-day -day livelihood. And I keep on saying that can never be a solution. It can never be. And sometimes until you go to some of these environments, you may never understand what really happens. But the moment you talk and you're able to explain to them and they're able to see, then we realize that ours is that we have just been entrusted and we need to take care of what God, God has entrusted to us. And number three, I am responsible to increase what God has given to me. I'm responsible to increase what God has given to me. And sometimes we don't increase it. What do we do? We diminish it. And the question sometimes I have asked, even when I'm, I've spoken to teachers, like especially in high school, you got a child who was an A material, 400 is A. But now they are leaving the school with what? A grade? See, what happened? I ask a teacher who is in class three, you got a child from class one who was an A material. But now, in your year, that child has moved from being an A material, they have become... You got a child who did not know how to curse. But now the child can be able to can curse using any word. They can actually sing any song out there except what is sung in the house of the Lord. Even in our own homes, what is it that we are making these children to see and to hear and to... Because we normally say our children get learn 90% from what they see, not from what they... So we might spend all our time saying, I don't want anybody coming here after a certain hour. I don't want anybody doing A, B, C, D. And you, what do you do? You come home, you know, drunk, right? There's a story who is told of a father who one day was going to work. And the son just followed the father. And the son is just doing like how the father does. He, he's... So the father looked back and he's wondering, what is this young man doing? You know, he's, he's just <laughs> and the father waited for the boy and asked the boy, why, why are you walking like that? Dad, I'm practicing to be walking like, like you because that is what they have seen and they think it is cool to walk like dad. You know? So that thing that you normally do, you will see it one day, I can assure you. One day it will happen. And that is why we normally say, be cautious with the words that you use. Be very careful with the language that you speak in your house. Be very careful with the kind of words that you use because one day you will also see them projected back to you. They pick 90%
from what they see in us, not what we, what we say. And therefore, we can only be role models. We can only choose to be people that are children. We will look and say, the other day I was asking young people who want to get married, and I asked them, would you want to marry yourself? If you are given yourself to marry, would you want to marry your, yourself? And now somebody looked and said, goodness, with all my uh, craziness, with all my ABCD, how can I be able to? And <laughs> that was the reality. Because sometimes we need to face the reality. That though the person you are, when you see it reflected back to you, then what happens? You can either increase that what God has given you, or you can decrease that what God has, has given you. And for us, I pray that this morning we shall be deliberate, whether we are teachers or we are parents, that we shall be deliberate to say, nobody will pass through my hands that I want this person to be the same. I say it in my place of work, that no staff can ever walk into my hands and I leave them the same. I must transform you to be the best that you can be. And that is the responsibility we are given, even as ministers. When we are in the church, we normally say, there will be nobody that shall walk out from here. And they come out feeling worse than they, because they have come to meet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In our homes, can we also make them to be the environment of transformation, where our children shall be changed to be better people than we are, because we shall produce a reflection of ourselves. God can call me to account, that is point number four, God can call me to account at any time. As you see, these people did not know when the owner will come back. But when he came back, he called them. And he asked them, where are my talents and what have you done with them? And the one who had five talents, he was able to come back with another five talents. And the owner says, what did they want to say? Welcome. You know, faithful. You are faithful with the little that God has given you. You are faithful with everything that God has laid your hands. God, the, the owner said the same thing with the one who was given two talents. Because God in the first place does not equate us. We shall be given responsibilities that are equal to our capabilities. There are those who are meant to have brought up the MPs. There are those who are meant to have brought up the, 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 the Chief Justice. There are those who are meant to have brought the business people that will come and change our country. There are those who are meant to have brought up the teachers and the doctors and the engineers and so forth. And therefore, we can never equate ourselves with how somebody else does. God gives us gives us responsibilities according to the capabilities that we have. And we shall be awarded not because of the return, but the, the, the contribution. What have we done? This one who had five and the other one had two, they had done similar effort and they did the same. And God was there. The owner was there to congratulate them. So let us do the best that we can do with the children that God has placed in our hands. Let us be the best. If there can be a good teacher, aim to be that good teacher. If there can be a parent who changed their children, be that parent who can change their children. And I know you have heard the stories of the Moody Awaris and the stories of the family of Mongoiria and the rest, that it is because their grandfathers knew the Lord. They are the ones who are among the first people to plant the word of God in their neighborhoods. And they were able to change, communicate that to the children. They were able to gather their children every day. And their children also did the same to their grandchildren. You, even if it never happened in your home, you can start it. It is your time to say, I'm cutting off all those things that are following me from the generations in the past. I am beginning a new generation for me and my children and my children's children. Because there can always be a new beginning with our God. His masses are new every morning. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. One day, we shall go before the judgment seat, and we shall be judged, because God has put in us 
God has everything that we needed for us to go through this world successfully. All we needed is to try to be the best that we can be. But you know what? Many times we are busy trying to think, how can I be like Nelson Mandela? I'm talking to the politicians here. How can I be like Magari Mathai? I'm talking to the academicians in this place. How can I be like Jimmy Kimani? I'm talking to the preachers in this place. But yet we don't know that God has made us unique and different from everybody. That uniqueness is what must start out. We must keep on asking God, what is my purpose on this world? What did you want me, Father, to do to achieve when I'm in this world? And I charge each one of us that when we go back, let us take time to evaluate and see what did God want me to achieve while I'm in this world of the living. Because the time is coming when I'll not be in this world. And that time is when I'll go before my maker. And I'll be expected to be able to say, I was supposed to. And we, know, we, are, we are told that sometimes we shall be shocked. When we see all we were meant to have, somebody said, when we see the Mercedes Benz that was meant to be you as Brother Gedai, you know, that Rejnova and that yacht and that big house in that place was meant to be yours? That is what you're supposed to have done with your children? One of them was supposed to have become A, B, C, D? But we did not do it. And I pray that will not be any one of us because we shall do everything within our capability to achieve what God intended for us to achieve. As Christians, what can we do? First thing, let us be people who pray for our children. I like it because I know Cornerstone, we take time to pray for our children. Teachers and, some, and the students, we take time to pray together. In our homes, let us be people who every morning, one day, um, the, the, when my daughter was in, I think, class seven, I got into the habit of taking her every morning, then in the evening she would come with the bus. And we would go, you know, getting time, we would talk, we used to talk a lot and so on. But then one day, as I was packing, we were just talking, I would just tell her, walk like a lady of greatness, walk like a, a lady who can conquer the world, think like a winner, you know, those are the things that you'd say. I saw a mother next to me who was, her heart was on a child, and she was praying. And I thought, this is good. And I decided, I'm picking this, because it is not bad to copy things that are good from somebody else. And from there on, every morning, I would make sure that I lay my hands on my daughter, and I would speak the word of God, and I would pray for her, and I would release her into the world. You know, because the moment you release them into this, you don't know what they are waiting. The devil is working every day. And therefore, every morning, when my dad calls me and told me, I have been praying for you, I remember, I keep on saying, there's nothing greater than that. To hear, my old man, 90 years, is still praying for me? Hallelujah. I would, I would want to keep on praying for my own, because there's nothing greater that I can, that I can release them knowing they're, they're, they're insulated. When I talk about insulation, the guys with the, in the electricity field, they understand. When you're insulated, nothing can hurt you. Nothing can penetrate. You are fully protected. That is what I want to do to my children. And when I have done that, because the time is coming when I release them out, and I was there to release her in high school, our firstborn, and my wife was there, she was crying, and I'm asking her, are you crying? And she I'm releasing my daughter today, you know? And I said, we have done our bit. We have prayed for her. We have taught her the word of God. She has had us pray for her, and so on. The less we can only leave it to, to God. That even if she goes, that word that was planted in her, the seed will germinate, and it will grow. So don't give up. Don't lose hope. Keep on praying for them. Job is a good example. In Job 1, 5, Amplified Fashion says, when the days of their feasting were over, Job would set for them and consecrate them, rising early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For God said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cast God in their hearts. Job did this at all such times. That every time the children would have a feast, you know Job was one of the richest men, I'm sure, maybe the likes of uh, Dagote, maybe the likes of Manu Chadali and so on. Where the men? He was said to be the richest in his time. And the children had their own homes. And each of them was into riches. And they used to call each other the brothers. And the sisters would join them. And they are feasting. But Job knew in the process of their celebration, they may have cursed the Lord. They may have done something against God's will. 
And therefore, Job would take time, call them, consecrate them, pray for them, and then would release them. May we copy from Job. May we be the ones that will call our children and bless them. May we release them every morning with the blessings and with the cover of the Lord because that is what the Lord wants us to, to do. Secondary, teach them the word of God. Teach them the word of God. You can put for us Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. Okay, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Please go on. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. That the word of God will be taught to the children. First 8 is saying, You shall bind them as a sign on your heart. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Please go on. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Verse 10. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he sowed to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. God is telling the children of Israel, through Moses, that the word of God needs to be taught to the children. It needs to be bowed in their hearts. You know, when we were in primary school in class four, our mathematics teacher, God bless mathematics teachers, made us to wear on our, on our necks the multiplication table. I don't know, <laughs> multiplication table. And the teacher would meet you anywhere and ask you seven times six. And the next thing on your head, he is hitting you on the head until you say 42. You know? And that we had to know it, first you put it here, that everywhere you walk as a class four child, everybody can see you know this thing. And therefore, any teacher can ask you that question. And you know, any teacher could beat you. And sometimes when they found you being beaten, they could also add on to their beating, right? So that that thing soaks in you, sinks into you. You, 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 you are like a sponge in water. You had to know it, right and left. That is what God is saying. That you put it on the doorpost. You put it anywhere the child can walk. They will be seeing the word of God. That the word of God will sink into them. It will saturate. That every circumstance they get into, they can remember the word of God says A, B, C, D. Because they are fully prepared. I knew more memory verses in my childhood than I have known now. Because every Friday when my dad came, we had to memorize a fast. And he would have to teach us a memory fast. And we will have, when he comes, the first thing is we sing for him. And sometimes he would used to teach us songs. And I said we were many, so it would be a proper choir, right? <laughs> and, and I still remember, after Mawakazi, I wanted to join. Even him, he believed he was part of that. And we would be reciting with him. You had to know it. And the next time he will come, speak on a passage, and from that passage, there will be a word that we shall pick. I mean, I may not have done anywhere near what my dad did with me, but I pray that what I have been able to do, that they shall remember, even in their old age, that our father taught us the word of God. May you be the mother and the father who will teach your children. Why? Because the, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from, from it. Joel Austin speaks of the kind of child he had become when his father was the bishop, when his father was the minister. And him, he was a wayward child. But when his father passed on, of course he had come back and now he was, he was, he was huddling the media. But when his father passed on, the elder said, it is your responsibility to take up from here. We all know what he has been able to do. Because of the word that was invested in, in him. In between things may happen, but we know that seed will grow. And one day they'll be able to take offer from where the father had left. They'll take offer from where you have gone. 
and they will say, I'll be a better mother, I'll be a better father, because my mom did everything she could. I will do everything I could to be the best that I can be. Number three, speak life into your children's lives. Or speak life into your children's life. It is for you to command blessings. It is for you to ask the best for your children. Let them know that they have their backs covered by you. That wherever they can go, they can come back. And they know at home it is safe. You are there for them at all times. Help them to see the future. And with this also comes another point on spending quality time with our children. We have become so busy, our jobs have taken everything. And we are not saying that's, that, that's, it's good to get a future. It's good to, 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 to do the best. But the moment that you have spent quality time with, look for every opportunity to be with them. Because even in between work, you have some time that you can dedicate to your children. And when I'm talking about this, I'm also talking because the, the, some of you are also parents, not because of your own child, but there are some children that were brought to you, either by your sister or your brother, or even your parents told you, from here on, you take over from, from here. And those children have looked at you like a, like a parent to them. There are also the children that look at you, even from the neighborhood. And that is why I said, even this one's rather rather in the estate, we have responsibilities. And you know, things are tough. Things are challenging. That is the reality. And not just in Kenya, it is everywhere. Who knew that artificial intelligence will come and take over many of our, of our things? Who knew that the moment you go to internet and you search something, from there on they keep on feeding you with that kind of thing? Who knew that supermarkets will be getting your data? And now they know Peter shops on around 25, Peter's birthday is allowed this time, the banks will send you everything. Big data is controlling our lives. Because everywhere we go, we are leaving our footprints, our digital footprints. And what is happening, other people are harvesting that data, data mining. And they are busy using it to keep on feeding you with information. So woe unto you if you visit some sites that are not worthy of your eyes. Because that is the information they will keep on feeding to you. And our young people are not exempt from that, isn't it? So we are there to protect them. One girl had faced so many challenges in this world. She was being bullied on the internet, um, the current social sites for the young people. They tell me Facebook is for the old, you know. <laughs> and, you know, she was being bullied and people were saying a lot of things. She was having a, a difficult time, even with her own boyfriend, and things were looking very crazy. And she thought, Am I, is it worth for me to continue living? And you know it is happening a lot to the young people. But she thought, before I do it, I know my mom cares for me. And she decided, let me go to my mom. And she told the mother all the things that have been bedeviling her. All the things she, she feels it has come to an end. She can't hold it anymore. Because the influence out there, the older people may not know the impact it is having. But her, she was feeling it is the end of her time. And the mother told her daughter, just sit here. The mother took three, three pots and put water in it and started boiling that water. And when the water was boiling, she took carrots and put in one pot. And the carrots started boiling. She covered them. The other pot, she put eggs and boiled them. In between, she was busy crushing coffee uh, seeds, coffee beans. And she also put the powder of the coffee beans into one pot. And she allowed them to boil for the next 10 or more minutes. Then after that, she put out the banner. And she called the daughter and said, what do you see? And the daughter said, I'm seeing carrots and eggs and coffee. I can smell the coffee. And the mother said, why don't you go and lift the carrot and remove the eggs and also remove the coffee. And the daughter went. She took the carrots, and the carrots were soggy. You know, after being boiled for that long, 
they had become soggy. And the eggs, they had become hard. And there was the coffee, of course, it was not easy to separate from the water. And the mother asked her, when challenges come, do you behave like carrot? That you looked tough, you looked strong, you looked confident, but in yourself the moment challenges come, you become wobbly, you become soft, you become weak, you become nothing that people would want to see. Is that what you become when challenges come? Because surely challenges will come. And the mother asked her, how about the egg? The outer shell was covering the egg liquid inside the egg. But once it is boiled, the egg became what? It became hard. Is it that when you're subjected to challenges of life, you build in yourself bitterness, you become a hard person. You don't even allow the word of God to penetrate you because bitterness is eating you up. And you keep on saying, I cannot forgive them. You know, I will die with this in me because of what you did. The mother told her, this is not the right thing to do. And she told her, smell the coffee. And she said, when the coffee was mixed with hot water, the coffee changed the water. From the water, from that harsh environment that has destroyed the carrots and the eggs, to now an environment that everybody wants to smell the coffee. Are you like coffee? That you change the environment that you are in. When difficulties come, you are able to go through the difficulties and many times you are the person who changes the environment. That people can turn to you because they know when they come to you, you are the person who can be able to hold the situation together. Are you the carrot? We can ask ourselves this morning, are you the carrot? Or are you the egg? You're still holding bitterness in your life. There's still that person that you're not forgiving. There are still those situations that you feel you are not, you are, you are, you are not willing to let them go. Or are you behaving like coffee? You are willing to change situation no matter what. The last point that I have is we also must discipline our children. Discipline is important. As you have heard, there's a gentleman who has told me that we still need to be disciplined because of the report he received from our wives who went to see him yesterday, you know. <laughs> and I can tell you him, he never spared the Lord, you know. He ensured that we are properly disciplined. The Bible gives very clear instructions because we said that is the reference point, that's where we should go. It gives very clear reference points on what parents should do in teaching, training, and inculcating discipline in their children. Proverbs 13, 24 says, whoever spares the Lord hates their children. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. And discipline can be diverse. Discipline can be spread. Today we are telling people, be creative in the way you discipline. Because we have seen people killing others with a cane. We don't want that. You know? So there's the, all that creativity that we want. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Discipline your children, for in that there is hope. Do not be a willing party to their death. There's a story that is normally told. There's a mother who went to listen to the case of her son in court, like what we saw the other day. And the mother was there, listened to the judge, and the judge talked about the son who had killed, he had stolen, he had, you know, harassed people and so on. And the judge said, you deserve to die. The judgment is only death. And the son requested, judge may I have just one minute with my mother. And the judge was amazed. What do you want to tell the mother? I want to tell her only to her ear. And the child went closer to the mother. And the mother brought the ear to hear. What does my son want to tell me just before he dies? And the son went to the mother's ear. And his teeth sank into the mother's ear. And she beat the mother so hard that the police had to rush to try and separate. But she beat the, the, the ear until it came out with him. And the judge asked, why would you do that to the mother? And the boy said, when I was a young boy, and I would go and take somebody's shoe, my mother would help me to hide them under the bed. When I went and took money, my mother is the one who said, thank you, son, we didn't have anything. Now you have helped us in this family. When I went and I started stealing bigger things, my mother is the one who was receiving me and congratulating me. I was building the house with the money I was stealing. 
and my mother kept on congratulating me. That is why I will not die alone. I wanted to inflict in her enough pain for her to feel what I'm going to feel in a short while. And the judge looked at the son and he said, I set you free. Because the real culprit is who? We have failed many times in carrying out our responsibilities as parents. And as teachers, sometimes we have not done what we are supposed to do. And we are told, don't stop talking even if they pretend they are not listening. Keep on talking because like the hyena told the stone, even if you don't respond, you have heard me say. Many times, parents, we have missed it. And this morning, if you are like me, there's somewhere that you have failed. And I want us to start. I want us to start. Parents and teachers. I will not ask us to come to the front. I will not ask us to say anything. But I want to call Pastor Beatrice. I want her to lead us in a prayer. That we may seek forgiveness where we have failed as parents and as teachers. And that God may remember mercy upon us that from today onwards we can make the right decisions. Our children in the next two weeks will be coming home from school. There are those that are working, there are those that are in primary school, they are together with us. May we choose that this day we shall follow the word of the Lord. That we shall be people who will be the change agents in our time. We shall help our children to be the best that they can be. May the Lord bless us, may the Lord keep us, may the Lord help us to be the best that we can be.